everybody and welcome to the Mile End Campus at Queen Mary University of London, one of our eight locations now in, in London, the largest campus of course, and to this uh, Peston Graduate uh, Centre, the Peston Lecture Theatre. So thank you very much for coming this evening. I know many of you are familiar with our campus, but the students here, uh, many of you will be joining our campus on a more, less frequent basis, but you are most welcome. Uh, my name is Professor Francis Bowen. I'm Vice Principal for Humanities and Social Sciences here at Queen Mary and I'm very delighted to be uh, welcoming uh, you to this event today uh, hosted by our Mile End Institute. Uh, many of you will know the Mile End Institute was founded in 2015 under the guidance of our patron, uh, Lord Hennessy, Peter Hennessy, and brings together politicians, policy makers and the Queen Mary community uh, and the, the broader public to debate the major challenges facing East London and the UK. Of course, it's entirely consistent with Queen Mary's um, overarching aim and positioning here in, in the East of London, aiming to open the doors of opportunity through our research and our education uh, to, for underprivileged people wherever they may come from, uh, though of course, primarily uh, in, the, in the local area here, our local students and communities here in East London. So the Mile End Institute has a few events, um, shameless plug, coming up in the next month. There's more on the Mile End Institute's website, uh, but just for your diaries, on Thursday the 23rd of March, we'll be considering how much progress has been made in recent years to rectify the historic underrepresentation of women in government and in public life. And on Tuesday the 28th of March, we'll be joined by Dr Nick O'Donovan, Vicky Price, and Lord Wood of Anfield to chart the history of the so-called knowledge economy and to discuss the UK's economic future. But of course, events like this don't happen without a lot of people behind the scenes doing a lot of work. Here I'm looking over at our student ambassadors. Thank you very much to you and to, to your colleagues for, for helping us out. Um, also, thank you to Ellie Whitehead and Ollie Davis in David Lammy's office. Uh, to Fleur Greenleys in Queen Mary's events team, as well as, of course, our student ambassadors from the School of Politics and International Relations. So, tonight's event is the latest in our very popular In Conversation series, where we feature conversations with high-profile politicians, and tonight's guest is David Lammy. I'm not actually going to do much of an introduction, I'm going to let the conversation unfold, uh, but I'm very much looking forward uh, to David's reflections on his early life, becoming the first black Briton to graduate from Harvard Law School, succeeding Bernie Grant as the MP for Tottenham, and serving in Tony Blair and in Gordon Brown's governments. Um, also, we'll also ask David about the Labour Party's programme for government and his vision for the UK's foreign policy. And tonight, David will be interviewed by a freelance journalist and former political diarist at the Evening Standard, Marie Lecomte. Thank you very much for joining us uh, to both of you. So just to give you a quick uh, outline of the format, what you can expect to happen, uh, Marie and David will talk for around 45 minutes-ish in, in conversation before opening up uh, questions to you all from the floor for maybe about half an hour, and then we'll go for a drink out of the foyer here. I've been asked um, if we can just stay in our seats while David leaves at the end, uh, just to be sure that we can all get to the drinks in a timely fashion. I don't know as whether David's going to hit the bar before us or how the, what the, uh, the instructions are about there. Uh, but in any case, thank you very much for coming. Um, thank you to David and Marie for leading today's uh, conversation. And please join me in welcoming Marie and David. Over to you. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, David, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, I don't think David Lammy really needs to be introduced, mostly to you guys, because you actually decided to come here. It would be weird if you did not know who he was. Uh, but no, David Lammy still was elected as Labour MP for Tottenham in 2000, uh, served as a minister in the Blair and Brown governments, uh, then spent about a decade on the backbenches and is now back, uh, so was first back as the Shadow Justice Secretary, uh, and is now Shadow Foreign Secretary in Keir Starmer's Shadow Cabinet. Um, and so, David, I kind of wanted to start by um, saying that researching this interview made me go quite mad because I tried to do my job, you know, and read everything I could, every interview you'd given, you know, everything you'd written. And you have spoken to everyone about everything for the past 23 years. I genuinely, there was a point where I could see you at the back of my eyelids when I went to sleep. Um, so, actually, I wanted to start by asking, 
What, what's the one question you just do not want to answer ever again from a journalist? Oh, no. <laughs> well, no, I, that, there isn't actually. I like questions. Really? And I might answer the question slightly differently depending on what I recall or what mood I'm in because I'm quite a, an emotional kind of person. And actually, um, we're sitting here in Stepney. Uh, my godmother, a great aunt of mine, lives across the way in the Ocean Estate. I remember coming to this area, probably I'd be about seven or eight on the bus from Tottenham. It was a big deal. My father used to bring me here. It was his favourite cousin. Um, other than that, I didn't come to the East End. You know, mm. Tottenham's a very... Well, London's a very parochial place. You know, you live in your neighbourhood. And we didn't travel very much beyond the community in N17, uh, part of North London. So instantly I've got a kind of warm feeling. And, and it's like guilty feeling because I sort of feel like I should have rung up my relatives and told them I'm just across <laughs> the way uh, but you know the way that diaries work you just don't focus on stuff so um, that's the mood I'm in so that's you know that that will condition the way I answer some of your questions excellent so yeah no questions on the table then and um, but since you actually talk about the politics so you again so you sat on the front bench against uh, against uh, under two prime ministers and then decided to go back to the back benches when ed miliband was elected as uh, leader of the opposition because you wanted to give him space and also to speak your mind um obviously that stint lasted for perhaps longer than you thought it would because you were there for nearly 10 years because some stuff was happening in the labor party in that time uh, so what what was that like because obviously from the second you got elected nearly you ended up on the front bench so you'd never really been a backbencher for a long period of time do you do you think that's changed you as a politician at all to spend that long um, doing your own thing, I suppose? I guess I knew when I was elected, I had a hunch, an instinct. It wasn't completely verbalised, but it was a, I had a hunch or an instinct that my political career would go on for a while. Um, um, Tottenham is generally seen as a safe seat. I have to say on election day, I never believe that. I always think I'm going to lose my constituency um, and get very, very worried. But, 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 but I, I, I basically knew that we would be in opposition at some point. I knew, I, I was not under sort of any apprehension that Labour would be in power forever. I knew it would come to an end. And I had quite a deep consciousness about what that would mean for folk in a constituency like mine, and a very strong consciousness of the work that people like my predecessor, Bernie Grant, had done um, as the, he was the leader of Haringey Council and then the Member of Parliament for Tottenham during the Thatcher major years uh, at administration. And so, in a sense, I would say at this point that my career, I don't know how long it will last, but let's say it's in, 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 in you know, thirds. Uh, the first 10 years was in government uh, and a junior minister, very junior in the Blair Brown years. Uh, the, the second period was, was in opposition. And I had a very clear understanding of what my role was in opposition. And uh, I think on, uh, Windrush, Grenfell, um, uh, particularly, I, Brexit, you know, I, I wanted to make my voice heard. And, um, uh, and then now we're, we're into a stage where I'm on the front bench, obviously as a shadow uh, uh, front bencher, but I hope, fingers crossed, uh, that Labour win the next election and we get to do it for real. Mm. And how are you finding that sort of balancing out? Because again, you're quite an outspoken person. You have issues you clearly care about massively. You probably could not be as outspoken as it used to be. Now you're a shadow Secretary of State. So how, again, do you balance out your brief on the one hand and on the other? The, again, issues that matter to your constituency, but to you as well. It's actually not as hard as you think. One, because we're in opposition. Mm. I think there is a sense of weariness and tiredness um, around this government. We're in London. You know, London uh, broadly uh, agrees with the sorts of things that I might say, uh, if you see what I mean. Uh, and two, um, you know, I think that um, I'm now in a much more senior position in the Labour Party. So I think I get to influence some of the positioning that we might make. And um, I make a contribution, I've made a contribution 
writing books and other things. So I, I, I don't, I, I, I'm not finding a struggle between what I might privately believe and the business of collective responsibility. Collective responsibility is important. Um, you don't generally achieve government if you aren't disciplined. Um, uh, you don't achieve government if you're not able to have your rows in private and, and reach a collective position for the public. So, you know, I recognise that. And, you know, I'm sitting here now as a mature... Uh, ish politician um, <laughs> able to play my part. Mm. Great. And so, looking back actually at that first third, I suppose, of your career when you were a junior minister, you were, I found a piece uh, from The Guardian in 2002 who called you one of Parliament's most glamorous MPs. So, first, did you remember that? And um, slightly more seriously, what, you know, when you look back on that, because you were the kind of archetype of the rising star in Parliament, you came in very quickly, you got promoted, got quite a lot of media coverage. At how how do you feel about that kind of looking back and is there anything you would have done differently um, if you could sort of go back? I've learned not to care very much about what, no offence, mm. uh, what, what journalists write about you. Mm. They've met you very briefly. They're conditioned by their own prejudices and assumptions. Um, it comes and goes. And when you've been around uh, as long as I have, you, you sort of realise that it comes and it goes. So I don't, I haven't, I don't, certainly not at this stage of my career, overthink what is written about me. Um, I do think that, um, I suppose the complexity of that question, there's something slightly complex behind that. It, it, it wasn't easy being young and black and from a working class background arriving in Parliament. Um, there weren't many folk like me. At that stage, there was only my colleague Una King, who of course uh, is well known to this part of the world, um, but lost her seat. And the truth is, the vast majority of journalists do not understand my experience. They did not, they, they have very little contact with being Windrush. They don't understand the juxtaposition of coming from Tottenham and ending up in Peterborough and going to, to Harvard. They said silly things like, um, what would they say things like, oh, you know, um, you're, you're really young, you must be ex... You know, they not really understanding that if you're from the kind of background I have, a lot of my peers had spent time in prison, had, had, were struggling with mental health, uh, had parents like mine who'd got periods of unemployment. I came from a broken home. I was raised by a single mum. Uh, that's what I brought to Parliament at age 27. I was not some young whippersnapper like... I don't know, a young Boris Johnson, <laughs> if you see what I mean. Mm. And that doesn't get a lot of credit in our political system. Uh, so, you, you, you know, if you go back, you read so much, so much nonsense, and I still read it today. Um, um, but I've learned, you know, in a sense, which lies behind your question, by the time... I was standing up on the back benches on things like Windrush or Grenfell. I absolutely understand the power of my experience, and that's what I bring to the table. Um, that's what I'm holding in my hand. In those early years, you can stand as a Labour politician, you can look at your opposite number, and you can see these Etonians and, and these Oxbridge graduates and all the rest of it, and you can be rather intimidated that somehow this place is more their place than your place. Today, I'm very happy to stand up, be the son of a single mother, know what it is to go back to a home and the fridge is empty because we, or, or the, the lighting's gone off because we couldn't afford the electricity, the electricity bill, have relatives in, uh, in one of the poorest countries in the Western Hemisphere that I still send remittances over for. All of that is what I bring to the table when I stand up in Parliament. Hmm. That's a very good answer. And so I guess... On a weirdly similar note, so you're actually one of the few shadow cabinet ministers who has proper government experience, because, you know, Keir Starmer was never in the Labour government, Rachel Reeves was not. How? I'm quite interested to find out how that works, I suppose, internally in the shadow cabinet. So does that feature, so you obviously and a handful of others who know what it's like to be in power, um, do you talk about that internally? Do you ever have to step in, actually, and say, well, actually, you know, this sounds like a good idea, but I can tell you now the civil service is not going to go for that. Or like, how does that work, actually? Well, I think that there is a collective consciousness that there are only a few of us that have actually been in government before. Myself, um, John Healy, who speaks for us on defence, 
um, Pat McFadden, our Chief Secretary of the Treasury, have all been in government. Um, Keir Starmer, in fact, because he was Director of Public Prosecutions, certainly has a powerful sense of the way Whitehall and the civil service works and would have had a lot of engagement, particularly with the Home Office uh, and the Justice Department. Um, uh, we're doing a lot of work to prepare for being in government. There's been some controversy in the last uh, week or so about the preparation that we're doing and who we're appointing uh, mm -hmm. to help us uh, on that journey. And, um, and, you know, we're working with organisations like the Institute for Government to properly prepare the team and get ready. And I'm obviously thinking, I think the cycle would be, I'd say, that this year you, you know, you'll hear much more from us on our policies, our proposals, our vision for the country, so that by the time we get to a general election at some point, I think in the latter part of 2024, the public will have a good idea of how, to, how, the, you know, how the country would be different under Labour. But part of that is also preparing for government. Of course, we have a civil service, a, a neutral civil service, and they too uh, get to a point where they come and ask the official opposition what we would do. They're listening carefully, reading my speeches, Keir's speeches, and they start to prepare themselves for uh, uh, the possibility of a change of government. Hmm. And so I guess coming on to your brief, so reading... Obviously, a lot of what you've written in the past in interviews you've done, you strike me as someone who's actually very anchored in England, so be that in London, in Tottenham, in Peterborough, which you've talked about a lot and stuff. So I, you know, I'm not pretending I could do his job for him, but I would say that, you know, Shadow Foreign would not have been my obvious guess for you in Shadow Cabinet. So how, because you're clearly a very passionate and driven person. So what, what drives you in foreign issues? Um, I think it is um, fair to say that I have been quite located in domestic public policy, um, in part because of the nature of the constituency, um, tough, some of the tough issues, knife crime, riots, race, um, education. Um, but the truth is that um, I'm, I'm quite a strong Atlanticist. I obviously studied in the United States, worked in the United States, personal friends with former President Obama, good relations with the Democrats. Um, I was pretty active in the Brexit debates because I'm very strong on Europe. And I've been around in politics for a long time. So I've actually built up friendships, um, mainly across progressive parties um, in different countries of the world. Obviously, I've got, um, uh, you know, I should say I'm a dual national. I have um, citizenship for Guyana, where my parents are from in the Caribbean, good relations in that part of the world as well. So, uh, and I represent in Tottenham, um, uh, certainly I think the N15 postcode is the most diverse postcode in the country, uh, uh, with almost 300 languages spoken in that small area. So, uh, I actually do, you know, foreign policy, um, I, I'm very much enjoying. Um, um, and uh, have found myself sort of being able, being quite versatile, actually, uh, and drawing on experience both of some of the issues in the places that we're thinking of, but also friendships that built in Europe, friendships built in the United States, and obviously coming into this brief at a very, very tough geopolitical moment. So um, I'm enjoying the brief very much. I do hope to be Labour's um, foreign secretary, but I'm sort of sanguine about politics. You never, you know, you never have any role other than being a member of parliament forever or for, for very long. Um, so I'm, you know, uh, once we've been elected, once I've done the job for a little while, I, I quite suspect I will be returning to domestic uh, policy issues. Hmm. Interesting. But so in, in the meantime, how, because you've been in the job for about a year and a half now, uh, it's not been a quiet time uh, for foreign affairs, it's fair to say. So how have you managed to kind of balance out trying to build quite a big picture policy framework and you know exactly you know, what you're talking about, kind of what Labour would do uh, in, the de in that department while also at the same time trying to deal with absolutely everything that's been going on because there's always been basically at any given point, I think in the past year and a half, something absolutely massive going on. So how do you balance out the kind of immediate priorities and again the more big picture stuff? Well, I think that the, the war in Ukraine has concentrated minds. Mm. Um, uh, it's concentrated minds because 
uh, it underlies the way that foreign policy is domestic policy. Um, and what do I mean by that? I mean because Putin effectively um, has weaponized energy, uh, which has a bearing on the cost of living crisis that we're experiencing in this country. Uh, he had prior to that weaponized, uh, to some extent, uh, immigration. Uh, um, his um, bombing of Syria drove a lot of immigration into Europe and, and in some ways, it, in part, leads to some of the debates that we're having in our countries as, many, as well as many other European uh, countries. Um, you know, we've had a vexed debate about interference in our politics, of course, and um, uh, there was certainly a debate about interference externally in the decision to leave the European Union. Um, so there's a weaponized politics uh, at this time. We're also living through a period in which uh, the United States is no longer the only global superpower. It has to share the stage with China, um, uh, and that uh, is driving, a, um, I think, a, you know, a world in which, as a result of what's happened in Europe, countries like ours has to de-risk some of that and, um, and think very hard about not being dependent uh, on China. And that's certainly going on across all of Europe. And so uh, these are very interesting times. I think that, that there's a growing, um, we're living in a growing multipolar world, growing regionalization. Britain finds itself outside of any one major block, um, which is obviously a major development for us. Um, and I th the, the big theme that I would bring to the bait is that uh, whilst the phrase that the Conservatives deployed, take back control, um, uh, was, uh, you know, presented some real issues for many, I think probably at the time, it, you know, it was an effective phrase because it, it, it played into the sense that globalisation was failing for many people in the country. And I think they're probably right about that. But I think they were wrong to think that that means that Britain goes it alone. We can't go it alone. We have to be connected and engaged in the world. And I think the Labour Party's job is to reconnect us once again to the outside world. And that's across a whole range of, a whole cr a range of ways, not just with our friends and colleagues in Europe, but also uh, on things like development aid where it's been cut back to the bone and you really can't speak to any country in the global south and they've not mentioned it and recognise it at a time particularly where the biggest challenge that we're facing is the climate emergency. Mm. But actually on that note, so would you bring back the 0.7 international aid target in government? Or? Well I've said uh, over and over again as recently as on the rest of politics with, um, with Alistair Stewart and Rory, Alistair, Alistair Campbell and Rory Stewart that um, we will bring back, we want to get back to 0.7 as soon as the fiscal environment allows. Um, obviously, we're in a very strange f fiscal environment at the moment uh, with as many budgets as we've had. We've got a budget in the next couple of weeks. We don't quite know what we're going to inherit, but we want to get back to it. But we certainly don't want to be in a position where even the money that we are allocating, the 0.5, um, half of it's being spent here in the UK. Um, and that is the case currently. And mm a lion's share of that, billions, is being spent on um, effectively hotels for refugees. So um, that's a big absence from the international community. Mm. Well, I guess that sort of on the topic of money as well, which, uh, you've touched on Ukraine a bit. Um, is there, is there an, are there any conversations in the Labour Party at the moment over what would happen, you know, when the war ends, hopefully, obviously, after Ukraine wins it? Because uh, Britain has been, I think, a very, very good ally, obviously, to Ukraine during the war. How, how do we make sure that Britain remains a very good friend and ally to Ukraine uh, in the, you know, over rebuilding the country and making sure that peace uh, can be a possibility on the long term? Like, is this something you're looking at at all? Oh, well, look. The other thing I think is important about foreign policy is it's not all partisan, it's not all party political. There's a cross-party consensus on uh, economic, diplomatic, um, uh, military support for uh, Ukraine. Uh, very important for Keir Starmer to be there a few weeks ago. Um, and very important that when President Zelensky visited uh, Parliament, you saw that cross-party support across uh, Parliament. Um, I fear that... Um, you know, 
as they go into a big spring offensive and we see more rockets flying from Russia into Ukraine just today, that we're in for a very tough 2023. I think that Putin is attempting to play quite a long game. He knows that there are elections here in the UK <laughs> next year. He knows that there are elections in the United States. He, what he wants is division across um, uh, those that would re resist uh, his aggression and support Ukraine. And so we've got to stay united. All of us want peace, but in the end, the starting point for that peace is for him to exit the country. Um, and by the way, if you're Ukrainian, this did not begin uh, on the 24th of February um, uh, 2022. It began back in 2014. So um, I, we, it's, it's hard to read entirely how we're going to get there. All wars ultimately end with some brokering of peace. Uh, but I think at this time, as uh, Ukrainians are fighting for their country and their lives, uh, with rockets raining down on them, it, it feels like uh, uh, peace is not possible. Mm. I know, because you've mentioned that issues like the war are not really partisan issues. Um, to, I would have to admit, my slight bafflement, Ukrainians do seem to absolutely adore Boris Johnson. Um, is, like, would a Labour government use that in some way? Like, would, would you work with Boris um, on the kind of Ukraine, in whatever you know, shape or form he would be up for? Because again, he is just strikingly popular still with Ukrainians. And with this question, whether I was inspired by talking to a friend who is a Ukraine journalist, and I asked, what should I ask David Lammy? And he said, you know what? They really, really love Boris in Kiev. Uh, you should ask him about that. So there you go. <laughs> well, you know, I, I was in Kosovo at the beginning of January um, uh, and things um, had flared up just, just before I arrived. And they love Tony Blair because they feel that he played a big role in their liberation. And, um, you know, we're no longer in office, but of course the UK continues to support um, Kosovo. So just as um, I hope that we will get to the, to the point where we see the back of Boris Johnson, Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak. Um, uh, there will be continuity in, in a, in a Labour government and, and, and we'll continue to be cross-party on our positioning uh, mm. on Ukraine. And I think that the Ukrainians are a sophisticated bunch. They will, they, they, they're, they're able to have several conversations at the same time. Mm. And well, since you've... Um brought up Rishi Sunak, we'll come back to foreign affairs in a second, but so you said in 2019 that it's hard to see how you could be an ethnic minority and the leader of this country because it feels like half the country questions that legitimacy. Um, obviously, three years later, Britain did end up um, having an ethnic minority um, PM, so how, how do you feel about the fact that, you know, it happened um, and he's a Tory Brexiteer as well? Have oh, you shifted that, that view it, at all? I think it's great that we have um, uh, a Prime Minister who comes from a, uh, a diverse background. I think it's great that we have um, uh, so many ethnic minorities now in Parliament because I remember arriving uh, and it was literally, it was very, very different. Uh, I do think though we've got to be a bit careful. Um, you know, sometimes I worry that people see diversity in Britain as a choice between, you know, Eton and Winchester. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, diversity is broader than that. Um, but all credit to Rishi Sunak and Kevin Badenoch and Suella Braverman and, and probably in the end to David Cameron for um, being determined to make his party more diverse. Um, we had begun that journey prior to that, of course, and Tony Blair also had uh, diversity on his front benches and um, he was determined to have a very modern looking um, um, government. Um, but I think that the changes that David Cameron and George Osborne made are, are bearing through to now we see that uh, across Parliament. Hmm. And so I guess coming back to see the topic at hand, um, I think we probably have to talk about the Windsor framework. Um, I really tried hard not to uh, because it's been a very long few years for everyone, um, but I, I obviously can't not mention it. So I think it's been actually, I mean, I was personally quite surprised by the fact that Rishi Sunak did manage to get the EU to uh, concede on some, uh, some issues and also managed to shut up the kind of Brexiteer ultra section of his party. So it was arguably 
Um, I was about to say the highest point of his premiership so far, but the bar is quite low. Um, and so, you know, what, what did you make of it? Because I remember talking to Labour people even the weeks beforehand saying, actually, we have no idea what's going to come, what's going to happen. So what, what did you make in the end of the well, we, Windsor we, framework? We always said that the way to deal with this was through negotiation, was rolling up the sleeves, um, you know, getting the parties uh, in Northern Ireland around the table, um, sitting down with the European Union and doing a deal. And we knew that was the case because... You know, we were so instrumental in the deal that we did in the Good Friday Agreement in the first place. It, it was this strange, strange thing that sort of emerged from the ERG of having a, um, this protocol bill tearing up the international agreement that you'd struck just three years ago that came from the fringes of politics into the mainstream. That was the, that was the bizarre move. And that, of course, um, slowed down the ability to have a negotiation, it, 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 it ultimately it would have led to a trade war with the European Union at a time of a cost of living crisis. Um, it caused great harm, I think, to our relationship in Washington um, uh, because, of course, whether you're Republican or Democrat, their, their, their um, relationship with the Good Friday Agreement is well understood as well. So I think, um, and, and Joe Biden feels personally very attached to it. So. I think that that was the bit that was wrong-headed. The negotiation was always there to be done. Um, I'm pleased that Rishi Sunak realised that. Um, uh, and let's, you know, I, you know, the ERG are getting into the detail of it, so I don't think, I think we should sort of sign it off just yet. But, but it looks like uh, he's cracked it, and, and I'm, I'm pleased he's been able to do that because I think it's right for Northern Ireland. And, you know, they need to get... Um, uh, devolution going again and, and, and back up and running there and I think it's it's right for the UK as a whole. Hmm. So on the European Union actually because obviously it, it, it is you know you've talked about it tonight you've talked about it a lot like you feel very passionately about Europe and our place in it and our relationship with it like what what would you do because again Keir Starmer you know would probably be Britain's first properly post Brexit Prime Minister if he wins the next election uh, what, you know, do you have any examples of quite concrete things you would like to work on? So both the, the EU as a whole, but also maybe with the specific countries. Uh, what, how do you make that better, more stable relationship happen that you've talked about before? Oh, I think, I think that, um, you know, Keir Starmer and I did an event um, together and it was described by some of our European colleagues as, as like sort of listening to honey on toast or eating honey on toast. It was, uh, you know, a big difference to what they've experienced most recently. So I think that the first thing is at the moment we haven't got any structured dialogue with the European Union. We don't meet on a regular basis to discuss the issues that concern us, whether that's climate, whether that's artificial intelligence, whether that's the war in Ukraine. So we need to get to structured dialogue with the European Union. I think that we must rejoin the Horizon Scheme. We'd like to do that. I think there are big issues emerging with... Um, students and mobility issues across across the European families of countries. It's it's quite strange that there are more Chinese students studying here in the UK than the whole of the European Union combined. For example, that's a, I think a peculiar development since Brexit. I think there are issues around qualifications and. Uh, and understanding our qualifications borders. Well, there are issues around financial equivalency. I, was, I had a meeting in the city this morning and they were raising those issues. Uh, and it was, the, it was the case that the trade deal that we have with the European Union is up for review in 2025. And so sector by sector, um, it is important for us to be able, with our European colleagues, to go through those, those, those issues and look at where we can deal with some of the issues of friction that have come up. Uh, but the first thing is we will not be having in Keir Starmer, of course, a Prime Minister that describes um, President Macron as a foe or an enemy. I mean, and that's a good start um, uh, for friendly, cordial relations. Um, now, that means that obviously we're not back in the European Union, we're not in the single market, we're not in the customs union, um, but I think there's a lot that we can be getting on with. So the first step is to normalise our relationship and get back to structured dialogue again. And then the next stage, I think, under a Labour government is to build uh, on the relationship that we've got um, um, and the review that we've got in 2025. Hmm. I, like, I feel like we've talked about the EU, we've talked about Ukraine. Um, are there any sort of foreign uh, affairs issues that 
you care about a lot and I feel like you feel that you know people are perhaps not paying enough attention to at the moment like this can be your soapbox moment is there anything we should oh, care there, about there, the world should there, care there about there are lots of issues yeah. I think we should care because there's a responsibility to care mm. and I went there as soon as I could get there we should care about women and girls in Afghanistan and the nature of our withdrawal and the huge mm huge suffering and hardship that they're going through at the moment at the hands of the Taliban. I think we should care about extremism wherever it's, wherever it's rearing its head. And I am worried about um, elements that have crept into the government in Israel uh, and renewed tensions in the West Bank and in Gaza. Um, I think we should care about the Sahel area and the Horn of Africa and famine and... Um, uh, extremism uh, 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 entering into countries there that could cause real problems for us um, uh, in the in the years ahead and of course we should be very concerned about um, the posture of China uh, post their Congress last year problems in the Taiwan Straits uh, and where that might leave the global community um, uh, particularly so there's a you know there's a, I, I, don't, I can't pick one thing. Uh, there's a lot to be concerned about. And yes, of course, we're, we're having this meeting at a time of a cost of living crisis for our population here. But I think that in a university like this, it's always important to stress that um, the cost of food, the cost of fertilizer, rising inflation in much of the global south means starvation, it means poverty, um, uh, it means malnutrition uh, for a lot of young people um, uh, and, and that will have huge consequences for the global community down the line. Mm. Um, I apologise for how not smooth uh, the next segue is going to be, but they can't all be winners. Um, but no, so I feel like speaking of parts of the world that we don't talk about perhaps enough, um, your family is from Guyana. Um, and you've uh, talked about the fact before that you, so you didn't go a lot as a child, but you tried to go quite a lot as an adult, and so that you really feel at home there. Um, what was it like, assuming you couldn't go um, during the pandemics, and what was it like, kind of, I guess, being separated from that part of the world and that part of yourself, and also have you managed to go back since? I've very much managed to go back since. I was there at Christmas uh, with my family. Um, Guyana is a very important part of my life. Um, it, my mother's ashes are there. Uh, I have family there. Um, and, you know, it's an important part of my identity. Um, I, I wasn't lucky enough to be at Queen Mary, but I did study at SOAS, mm. uh, the great SOAS. And, um, you know, I, it's important for me to have a, to have a foothold um, in the Global South to, to understand things from a different perspective. Um, and, um, but it's also a country with a rich rainforest, um, um, preserving its rainforests with Amerindian communities as well as uh, former enslaved ones and indentured communities. So it's a, it's a, and the Caribbean region is somewhere I feel very, very at home, very relaxed, perhaps at my most relaxed. Um, and these days, you know, perhaps because I've been around such a long time, I'm not, it's not as easy um, to be on downtime in the UK. Um, and so um, Guyana and the Caribbean is, is somewhere where I can go with my family and, and, um, and it's very special to me. Hmm. And so I guess you, you have a lot of sort of overlapping identities, I suppose, of being Ghanaian, being British, English, a Londoner, um, you're Christian as well. Don't we all? Well, it, no, no, but, you know, as well, but that, that was going to be my question of actually, how, how do you think, like, how do those identities, I suppose, matter and how have they shaped your politics specifically as well of having kind of, again, you probably have more than most, I would say. I don't know if I do, really. I mean, they, 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 you know, I'm a Londoner. All Londoners have a rich heritage to bear, to bring to, you know, even if it's, if it's, you know, you've moved from another part of the UK to London, there'll, there'll be a story. Um, you know, you're... I mean, the best way to answer this is to remember that the great story of the 20th century was at the beginning of that century. Um, 
the vast majority of people were not able to self-actualize in their lifetime. They weren't able to be who they want to be in their lifetime. And as I look at this room, uh, what I see in here, I suspect, are the vast majority of people in this room would have been in that box. If you were a woman, you were the property of a man, uh, your father or your husband. Uh, if you were black or brown, you were colonized, previously enslaved. If you were working class, you were down a pit, down a mine, you were at the mercy of the boss. Um, if you were LGBTQ, you certainly couldn't love who you want to love in your own lifetime. So the vast majority, there are, will be a couple of people in here who are a bit like Boris Johnson, uh, 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 you know, but the vast majority of people in here um, have, have a backstory of progress over the course of the 20th century that leads them to this point. And so my identity is wrapped up in that story, of course. Um, uh, and, um, you know, the, the, but I, I, I insist on this business of being not just a Londoner, but being English and being proud of being English. This is where I raise my family. It's a privilege to represent, an absolute privilege uh, to represent not just Tottenham, but to be a member of parliament in this democracy. And even though my job is to critique the democracy and to critique this government and to challenge this government and to want us to do better, want us to do different, I, I, I'm always crystal clear. I, it's, I get to go all around the world and this is still one of the best countries in the world in which to live. And we certainly have the best sense of humour. Um, and I happen to have the best football team. So we've got a lot going for us. But actually, that you made my segue for me, so thank you very much. But um, So you've talked about before the fact that the Broadwater Farms riots in Tottenham uh, were quite a formative memory for you because they were kind of, they happened in your neighbourhood, but you were up in Peterborough at the time, so you kind of watched that from afar. Um, and obviously, sometime after that, you wrote a book about the 2011 riots. Um, you know Tottenham probably better than anyone or better than most. Um, do you, do you think the situation has changed since the 2011 riots? Do you think we could see riots again? Or, you know, what, what do you think needs to happen to prevent them, if so? Um, just any, any thoughts? Well, that's know? a loaded, that's a big question. Um, yeah. yeah, we only have about 10 minutes left of that, <laughs> bit, by the way, so yeah. So, um, it's definitely taken years off my life living through two riots in the generation, the 1985 Broadwater Farm riots and the 2011 riots, which were horrific uh, to, to live through. Um, and just to evoke why they were horrific, um, to stand with, you know, men and women holding just their children with their possessions burnt to the ground, um, you know, with people, with the disarray of that, Mark Duggan shot dead. Um, it was a tough, tough, painful, hard moment. And when you're the MP for that area and no one else seems to be leading, it's a, it's a tough, tough moment. Um, so it's not a light thing, riots, at all. Um, no one would predict riots lightly. Mm. Uh, they, they tend to take a spark uh, and they tend to take a perceived powerful sense of injustice. And that injustice is usually, you know, on the part of um, policing the state um, uh, in some shape or form, wherever those riots happen um, in our country or anywhere else in the world. Um, um, I, I wrote about it extensively, um, you know, in, in my book, Out of the Ashes, almost in a therapeutic way. All of my writing is a bit therapeutic. Um, and it's because politics is not, for me, politics is not just what you do in the, in the House of Commons, it, you know, or as, as, a, as a practicing politician, you know, putting your ideas down, it helps you explore how you feel about things at a particular given time. Um, and, um, and there are lots of ways to express your ideas, if you see what I mean, to explore the business of politics. Um, uh, I think that clearly race and policing are, remain challenging issues for our country. I was asked by David Cameron to do a review into disproportionality in the criminal justice system back in 2015. I produced a, a review that I think was widely supported across the political divide, um, but very, very sadly, um, whilst 
Theresa May took the review seriously because David Cameron had gone by the time I completed the review. Boris Johnson did not, in fact. He commissioned his own review, the Sewell Report. Um, and, you know, uh, that was widely panned uh, uh, by people in his own party as well as uh, other political parties uh, and communities involved. Um, so, sadly, the figures have gone backwards. Uh, I think it's extraordinary that we have more than, I think it's 53% of young people in our young offenders <laughs> institutes come from a black, Asian or minority ethnic background at this point in time. That's gone up since I did my review. Uh, and that will find its way into the adult prison uh, estate. I think the, the, the stop search figures now are one in six um, uh, young black youth have stopped and searched. So it's, it's the, I'm afraid that the figures are, are going in the wrong direction. And of course, there are now also profound challenges for the police um, following the uh, horrendous murder of Sarah Everard, the Bieber Henry, Nicole Kitt, uh, Smallman. Um, uh, uh, women are feeling unsafe. We've got the lowest uh, uh, rape prosecutions. Uh, that we've seen on record. So th I'm afraid uh, there's a criminal justice is a low ebb uh, across a range of fronts at this point in time. Mm. Do you think the Met Police can be reformed? I think the Met Police have to be reformed. And the reason they have to be reformed is because, uh, and can be reformed, we've got to believe in the Met Police, is because we have a policing model in our country that's very precious. What anybody says, it's policing by consent. Uh, with the consent of all the public. Uh, our police do not routinely carry guns. If you're in the United States, or indeed if you're just next door in France, where they do routinely carry guns, uh, we've got to hold on to that model. And policing by consent, not by force, means that the policing is done alongside communities and people. So obviously it's a huge problem if the police lose the trust of populations and we're having this conversation at a low ebb. Uh, but we've got to hold on to that model of policing by consent. Uh, the Casey uh, review is going on at the moment. Um, I actually have worked with Mark Rowley, who runs the police. I worked quite closely with him after the 2011 riots, and, and I wish him the very best of luck as he reforms, gets back to neighbourhood policing, deals with the misconduct issues that are... I mean, I think it's one in 43 police officers in the Met are... Mm. Are, are, are they're having to review the misconduct. He's got to deal with all those issues uh, and move forward. Hmm. Thank you, everyone, for coming. David, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to Queen Mary for hosting us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.